So hey, what's up guys? It's Ben. Today I'm coming at you with another video. And today is kind of going to be a continuation of last week's video. After Man, right? Because this is by the same author and it's a similar-ish concept of speculative evolution. And so this one is called The New Dinosaurs. So basically, the concept of this book is, okay... What happens if there isn't a mass extinction event that gets rid of the dinosaurs? What happens? And so this book takes a look at that. And so I'm going to look into some of these animals. I'm going to show you them. Um, and I have looked through this book before. But I'm going to show you some of the cooler ones. Um, and this one is also an interesting one too. Ethiopian realm. That's where we're starting. Wasp eater and then a tree hopper. Um, you have the lank and then the flarp. I don't think I'm going to go as in deep into detail about these. Um, and I may not include all of these that I, all of these. So you got the sandal, which burrows into the ground. And then you have the worm, spelled W-Y-R-M. So worm is a streamlined animal adapted to burrowing existence is what it says here and so i will show a picture of that okay let's move on to the next set okay so you got the megalosaur which looks a lot like kind of a t-rex except it might have longer arms but it looks very t-rex like and then you have the titanosaur which looks very similar to uh I'm trying to remember the name um but i remember long necks the land before time they call them long necks um and it looks kind of similar to that um, but now you have, on shoreline ocean islands, you have a dwarf megalosaur, and then you have a dwarf titanosaur. Bronchiosaurus? Is that it? Brontosaurus. Never mind, I'm just going to find it and put it in later. Now you have in the Paleoarctic, the Gestalt, which I'll show a picture of. And so the Gestalt... So they actually have, they have a colony, and they have a queen. It's a meter long. The queen is the, she's a meter long, and she's the largest in the community, in the colony. Um, it is unique among vertebrates because it pursues a communal existence. That's what it says in this book. Um, and so that's kind of cool, but we're going to move on to the next one. So you have a bricket, which has a very interesting head shape, a bricket. Um, and then you have a Zwim, Z-W-I-M. And so a Zwim, um, they're actually active swimmers, and thanks to its webbed hind legs and its flattened tail works that works with a strong up and down undulation. The eye is large and can adjust its focus to see both underwater and on land. So that's interesting. And that comes right from the book as well. Um, con Eater. The body is insulated from the intense winter cold. And then you have a jinx, which actually looks similar to the con eater, except it's furry or maybe? Different mouth shape, too. They're very similar. The, you got the tromble, which is um, a flightless bird, which I will show a picture of. And then you have the whiffle. Oh, and then this one's cool. This one kind of looks like a stegosaurus, a tarantor. And then its tail is not as round, though. It's, um, it's less of a ball shape, I think, from a stegosaurus, if I got that right. The, the barrel, near Arctic, that's where we're going next. Sprintosaurs, uh, very interesting head shape and kind of crest. The sprintosaurs evolved from duck-billed dinosaurs of the Cretaceous period. And so now let's move on to the next one. You have non-crested sprintosaurs. The, now you have a north claw is a coelurosaur, one of the more lightly built theropods, uh, apart from its head and furry coat. It differs little from its Jurassic and Cretaceous ancestors. The main difference is the massive single claw, the killing organ on its right forelimb. And then you have a monocorn, which reminds me a lot of a rhinoceros, but not exactly. It definitely has some very distinct differences. But this one's very interesting, and it does, it differs in appearance from members of its ancestral stock, such as Triceratops and 
Kosaurus, Balaclav, um, lives in small family groups in the highest mountains. Um, this one is very interesting shape too. Yeah, and so then Mountain Leaper. So I'm going to show a picture of that, Mountain Leaper. Um, then you got a Tree Pounce, and a Nogger, N-A-U-G-E-R, and then a Footle. Water Gulp, that kind of reminds me of the name of the Mud Gulper from uh, Afterman, but it does look very different than a Mud Gulper. The evolution of the legs and tail of the Water Gulp mean that it can move only in water. Its eyes and nostrils are high on its head, allowing it to see above the water surface when submerged. That comes directly from the book. That's a quote. Next animal, pangaloon. This one's very interesting, and it looks like it can, it can stand on its hind legs and also go on all fours. Scaly glider. Turtosaur. This one's a very interesting one because it kind of combines the more long neck nature of that kind of dinosaur, the long necks, but it's armored. And then next you have a lumber, which very much so looks like what I call a long neck. Interesting, kind of almost elephant-like, except really short face shape. Now, here's the one on the cover of the book. This is the Cutlass Tooth, which is basically a T-Rex, but it has a giant, like, front tooth. The Cutlass Tooth, I believe, prey on the lumber. Gormons are a two-legged, reptilian-looking creature. It is protected from other meat-eaters by a back armor of bony plates sheathed in horns. So you have a Raja font, which also looks like a long neck. I believe they... Herds have evolved defensive habits and take great care to protect their vulnerable young against predators. Hanohan is the next one. And then a taddy and a numbskull. So that name's interesting. Um, the next one, you got a tree worm, a fleuret, pareso, and then you have a glub, which I like the gloves. Gloves are, they're cool. The glub is totally adapted to live in the water. Its eyes and nostrils are on top of the head to allow it to see about on the surface while the body is submerged. Cribrum, which kind of looks like a flamingo, but a bit bigger. Then you have a pouch, and this is a very interesting one. It has almost translucent pouch that hangs down from its mouth to contain fish. And so that's a very interesting one. You got the coconut crab, which looks like an octopus with a shell. And then you have the shore runner, that's the next one. And then the oceans. Let's look at the oceans. You got a soar, S-O-A-R. And then you got a plunger, which looks kind of, it's got very sharp teeth, but it looks very penguin-like. These two are interesting. These next two are very interesting. You got a walk. It consumes the ocean's plankton. So it looks very similar to a whale, except it looks rounder and perhaps bigger. So bird snatcher. I think I've seen illustrations of dinosaurs that look similar, that were aquatic. They're very large, um, and so I guess these snatch birds out of there from the ocean. Pelor Pelorus, and then you have a kraken, which this doesn't look like what krakens are typically depicted as. These have a very shell-like shape, and then they have a bunch of tentacles with other tentacles on top of them. The air-filled chambers of the kraken shell mean that it floats with the living animals and its tentacles just submerged. It moves by expelling wastewater through its siphon, propelling the shell backwards and allowing the tentacles to trail behind. Um, the kraken's tentacles are used for catching animals and plant food. The trailing fibers with their hooks and stings are evolved from the suckers found on tentacles of its ancestors. When the prey is caught, it is passed to the mouth along the tentacles by muscular contractions. But that th that's the last animal of the book. Um, I'm just going to close up real quick here. That one's also an interesting one. I really like the concept of speculative evolution in biology. And actually, you know, if you're interested, I, there's another couple books that I have on that as well. Um, and this isn't the only work I believe Dougal Dixon has done. There's another book called Man After Man. Um, that one to me, though, is a little bit more science fiction-y. Um, it's supposed to be, okay, what, what evolves after man? But that one feels a little bit more science fiction-y. Um, it, less realistic, I would say. Um, and then I think he's done some other projects, but I really like these two books. Um, and I think there's something worth checking out. So, but anyways, um, I'm going to close this up. Uh, please like, comment what you thought of this video, comment what you thought of this book, um, and subscribe. I'll see you guys later.